be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And with our spirit. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or holy, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds that they rain, no more rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but he sought bloodshed. Righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Here, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock, shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. In the presence of heaven, so serve up your strength and come to help us. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepare your mountain for it. It is a root as man is the The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tentacles to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest and the sand and the beasts of the field and the grace of the honey. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. They 
When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. Why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Well, how do you like angry Jesus? <laughs> Nobody likes angry Jesus. We like friendly Jesus, Jesus who holds the children, who blesses the kids, Jesus who says, blessed are the blessed are the blessed are the blessed are you. But Jesus got angry too, and we can't ignore these words. In fact, arguably, if he's so impassioned, it must be important. We should pay closer attention, even if our instinct is to say, Let's just skip ahead a few verses. Isn't the prodigal son coming soon? Let's go back to mercy. Let's go back to redemption. I think we can understand today's passage if we break it up into a couple of sections and also maybe recognize that Jesus may or may not be angry at you. He's just excited. And there's something there for all of us. So let's take a look at today's gospel and break it up into three parts. A first part that's about Jesus to understand what's going on with him. A second part that may or may not be about you. Um, and a third part that may or may not be about you. We'll start with Jesus. This week we had vacation Bible school. And this is where we get together, you know, all of our elementary aged children. And we give them songs and we give them crafts and we give them science and we give them snacks. And one of the things we give them is Bible stories. And I'm the one who gets to tell the Bible stories. And I tell you, it's a really interesting discipline in a way for someone to ask you about your Christian faith. Take what you believe and distill it down so you can explain it to a seven-year-old, keeping their attention, in maybe five minutes or less. How do, you, how do you explain Jesus to a five-year-old? How do you take the complexities of the Son of God and lay it forward in a way that makes intuitive sense to them? And here's what I found myself saying. I found myself, as I told a little story with Jesus, I tell it with little figurines, because then they can look at the figurines, and then as I tell it, I told him, I said, you know, Jesus was just like everybody else. He was fully human. He was a kid like you. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He had to go to sleep. He would cry sometimes. If you skinned him or cut him, he would bleed. He was just like the rest of us, with one difference. And the one difference that made all the difference for Jesus was, what are you going to say? Here's what I said. I said, he never forgot about God. Now, here's where I would say, now, have any of you kids, do any of you sometimes forget about God? And you know what they all said? No. <laughs> Which I thought was great. I said, well, you know, sometimes when you get older, you forget about God. Maybe for a few minutes, maybe for a few hours, it might be a few decades, but there are times when you're older, older people sometimes forget about God. And we had a conversation, why do you think older people forget about God? Um, the kids said because adults are inside all the time, but kids get to be outside in God's creation. I thought that was very interesting. An argument for houseplants. <laughs> I said, Jesus I was like you. He never forgot about God. Never, ever, not for a moment forgot about God. That meant when Jesus was walking down the street alone, he was not walking down the street alone. Jesus was walking down the street with God. And when Jesus ate breakfast in the morning, he was eating breakfast with God. 
And when Jesus was walking to school, he walked to school with God. And when Jesus was studying, he studied with God. And when Jesus was in church, he was in church with God. Jesus was with God all the time. When Jesus brushed his teeth, he was brushing his teeth with God. And he always had God on his mind, which made him super aware when he saw things that would make God angry. Now, this isn't necessarily sinners, but it is. But it's also just people teaching wrong. Like when Jesus watched the religious leaders and they would say things like, well, you know, if you've ever had anything wrong happen to you, that was God judging you because God is angry. And if you don't watch out, he's going to throw you into hell forever. And Jesus thought, I'm not so sure that's right. God, I know God pretty well. And God is telling me he's a God of forgiveness. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of love. He's a God of second chances. He's a God of redemption. He's a God who wants to be your father and call us to his children. Call us as his children. Jesus never forgot God. And that's what made him so passionate when he looked at the world. A world that so badly needed what? God. Everywhere Jesus looked, he saw people that needed God. He saw families that needed God. He saw institutions that needed God. He saw leaders that needed God. He saw worship that needed God. He saw basic human beings going through the regular days that needed God. And eventually, he had to go to John the Baptist and say, I need you to wash away the old way because I need to come up out of this water and it's time to act. And this is the word of the day, act. Jesus was called to action, and Jesus was looking for people who would join him in action. What Jesus knew is that the world needed people to stand up and do something. See something, do something. Is there a sign in some churches that say, if you see something that needs to happen, do it. <laughs> and like, why is that so revolutionary? Somehow, because like, in the crowd mentality, maybe it's sort of the, you know, groupthink mindset. We all sit there and figure someone else is going to do it. Someone else is going to take care of it. And then social scientists done something like this. Like, the bigger the crowd, like, the less likely somebody is to do anything. You know, they look at people screaming in the street because they're being mugged. And the bigger the crowd is, the less likely anyone is to act. Jesus was the person who would stand up and act. Jesus would plan the, the baseball game. Maybe the baseball game. And I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wait for someone to do it. I see weeds in front of the, the chapel. I'm going to do it. That was Sue Lowry this week. She was carrying thistles that went from the floor this high. Six foot tall thistles in her gloves that she pulled out right here next to the chapel. Because she saw it and she did something about it. This was Jesus' way. Jesus was a man of action. So the first part of today's gospel is all about that. Jesus is saying, I've come to bring fire to the earth. Which is what? Judgment? Who thinks it's judgment? Maybe. But you know, the Bible doesn't only do fire and judgment. Can anyone think of a major story in the Old Testament about fire? Where was the fire was God? It's really obvious. <laughs> the burning bush. Right? The whole point of the burning bush was that it wasn't consumed. The bush wasn't consumed. It was on fire. It was constantly giving out energy, but it was never burned up. It was always giving and radiating just like God. Can anyone think this slightly harder? A New Testament story that involves fire where the fire is God? Pentecost. Pentecost. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for not going straight to the book of Revelation. <laughs> yes, there's a lake of fire. Maybe it's a lake of God. You know, maybe it's a lake of God in Revelation. Pentecost, where the fire comes down and the fire is God. The fire is good. Sometimes good and God. They often go together. The fire on their heads filled them with what? Passion. Because they got out of the locked room. They actually went out into the world and risked something. They actually went out into the world and did something. These disciples who knew Jesus was risen for 40 days were sitting there. Arguably, Jesus said, wait till you're filled with power. So maybe wait till you're filled with power or passion or like an overwhelming urge to do something. When you're filled with fire, go out and do something. 
Jesus is saying, I wish the world was full of fire. I want to bring the fire. I wish the fire was here already. I've got a baptism to be baptized with. And I wish it was already happening. That sounds like somebody who's ready to do something. And actually, also, the baptism is probably the cross, ready to risk something. Because standing up and doing something means risking something. You don't know how it's going to end. That's how time works. And you have to trust. Got to be a person of faith. Like that amazing Hebrews reading. To trust that if God is leading you and your heart is drawing you, that what you need will come before you and somehow you'll figure it out and it'll be okay. And in fact, because you acted, it'll be better than it was. So now the part about you. Because here's where in the sermon it's kind of like, so why is none of you doing anything? Well, you know, it's just like I'm kind of sick of the church constantly guilt tripping us, especially those of us who are here, right? Like, I'm here. Doesn't that count for something? Yes, it does. Here's where Jesus might be really grateful for you because it's entirely likely and possible you're one of the people who are doing something. And here's where Jesus wants to normalize your experience, where Jesus is saying, yeah, look, I've come to bring fire. I've come to bring baptism. And because you're my followers, I know that you're filled with the same passion. I know you are people of action. I know you are the kind of people when you see something, you do something. You are the kind of people that when you see the world going wrong, you rush forward and do something about it. And that divides you from everybody else. Because there's leaders and there's followers. Let's not put it that way. There's people who act and there's people who sit back and wait for someone else to act. And that divides the world into two categories. The ones who are doers and the ones who are sitting on their hands for some reason. Jesus is saying, you're a doer. And for that reason, that might make you different than everyone else in your family. That might make you different than everyone else in your organization. But in fact, I've come to divide people. Because there's people who are going to do nothing, and there's people who are going to act. And I've come to call you to act. And that, therefore, is going to create a natural division between who you are and who you used to be. Or how you are and how everyone else right now tends to be. And the question is, is it going to be three against two or two against three? Which one is going to prevail? Because the world needs people to do something. And if we can get three against two, that's so people who will act and people who will sit around, then you know what? Three against two, eventually everything is going to be resolved. Because there will be enough eyes looking at enough problems, reaching forward with enough love, and eventually we'll get there. But let's hope it's not three against two. Then the people sitting around doing nothing are the ones who are going to prevail. And there really is there's something that's in the balance right now. That's why I need you to be those people. And then recognize it's okay to be a little bit different. It's okay to stand up when nobody else is. And an encouragement to do that. Or maybe he's talking about you in the last part. Because this is interesting, you may or may not have noticed, but it says, then he addressed the crowds. He was talking, about the, he was talking to the disciples when he talked about this division kind of stuff. His followers, which is why I address that to you. But now he's talking to everybody else. Everyone who could be a follower who's doing nothing. He's talking to the people sitting on their hands. He's talking to the people in the bleachers. He's talking to the big crowds that are standing around waiting. And he calls them the hypocrites. He said, you guys, you know how to tell the weather when it's going to rain. You know how to tell the air when it's going to be hot. Can't you tell that now is the time when God is seeking to come into the world with power and love, and he's calling people to be part of the, part of the, I want to say army. Is there something we can do that's not military? To be part of the nonprofit. <laughs> to be a part of the church. Can't you tell that now is the time Like things are changing, eyes are opening, the world is opening up, opportunities are gaping before you. Can't you tell that though the time is right for you to stand up and act, and yet here you are as hypocrites. And I love to remember that the word hypocrites means what 
in ancient Greece. The mask actor. Yes, the mask actor. Very good. Actors, hypocrites were actors. It wasn't originally necessarily someone who was like, said one thing and did another thing. It means it's deeper than that. It's people playing a role, people playing a part. It's like, well, what is the role that you guys are playing? What is the part that you're playing that isn't true to who you are? And here's where I want to turn it again. Because sometimes the role we play is the part of someone who doesn't matter. Sometimes the role we play is the part of someone who doesn't have any gift. Sometimes the role we play is the part of someone who needs to stand back, who needs to wait, because things never work out for me. Sometimes the part we play is, is the part of the forgotten one. Sometimes the part we play is the part of the one that, that doesn't matter, that's not important, the one that, that God hasn't looked upon, the one that's not blessed, the one without opportunity, the one without skill, the one without uh, gifts, the one without a calling. And that's why we're standing there waiting, because we think we're inert, and we think we don't matter. And so Jesus is calling, maybe, possibly one way to understand it, he's calling us hypocrites to wake us up and say, that's not true. You are a child of God. All of you in the crowd. All of you have gifts. All of you have a calling. All of you have passion and fire that's waiting to be ignited. All of you have a place in the world, an opportunity, a, a niche somewhere that's waiting for you to get up and plan the, the, the game and, and, and pick the plan and start a book group and create a feeding ministry and take care of your neighbor's cat and like all of those things. There's enough ministries in the world for all of us and some of them the newspaper will talk about and some of them it won't, but God will see. So Jesus is saying to everybody else, maybe some of us here, stop acting and believing and playing the role of someone that doesn't count. Because Jesus was a man of action. More than anything he knew, that this world needs people full of love to stand up and see something and do something that makes a difference. Standing, let us proclaim our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people, receive these our prayers, 
which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, <clears throat> that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, and especially those we now name. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace. So to follow the good examples of St. James and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is a true saying worthy to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The peace of Christ be always Thank you. 
I do like a good, you know, a good piece, so feel free. That's part of why we're here, isn't it? That's why we're here. Um, lots of good um, um, crossword puzzles this morning, and lots of good announcements too. In your yellow uh, sign up, uh, your yellow announcement sheet. I do want to highlight um, that first one. We would love to be able this year to put together a master calendar by Church Fest in September that has all the main events for all the main organizations of the church for the next 12 months. So if you're in any um, parish organization or have any ideas of anything you might like to see happen this year, would you spend the next couple weeks um, putting together a calendar, looking at what it would be, when it needs to be, you know, balancing it against Thanksgiving and Christmas and the Michigan-Michigan State game and all those kinds of things? And then send us by the end of the month um, your calendar. And we'll cross-reference all of the dates and try to get that to everyone in September. Some other announcements there I'll let you take a look. Are there any others from the congregation? Yes, Henry. Uh, last weekend, we had a class reunion for those. It was a small group, but I want to tell you that Mrs. Hartwell did a fantastic job. Uh, the group didn't even want to leave to go to our next one. They just did a, such a great job with her talk about the history of the church. And I have another announcement too. We're, it's not a coffee hour, but if anybody wants coffee, there is coffee made to yeah. chat. And then <laughs> another one, I picked up a one of my classmates who weren't able to make it, put out a, a message that he had a cookbook. So I thought, because it's titled, uh, Sprinkled with Love. So it's gonna be an eight o'clock book out here. Anybody who wants to see it, if you want to take it home for the week, just sign it out and bring it back. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, please, in the back. I just wanted to remind everybody, I think most everybody at 8 o'clock is in the altar call, but yes. <laughs> or not, um, we are looking for new members of the altar call. So if you have friends at the 10 o'clock, Please uh, encourage them to join the altar go. It's a lot of fun. You only do it every six or so, six or seven weeks. It's not very often. I wanted to uh, let you know that uh, former members uh, Jim and Maria Turner, anybody remember them? Mm -hmm. uh, we had a wonderful time in visiting with them in, in St. James, North Carolina. So they send their greetings. Uh, and here's a funny one. You know that last Sunday I was in Dallas, uh, Texas, playing the, for a service of ordination for a nephew. And the other organist sat there next to me pretty much, and she said, well, that was just amazing that you used your iPad for the whole service. And I think some of you know that if I turn a page, I just have to move my mouth one way or the other, and the camera sees it, turns the page. And she said, That's great, but do you have a tick in your mouth? <laughs> 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 Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice.
Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, in our bounden duty. And we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, who by water and the Holy Spirit hast made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth thy glory in all the world. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna.
our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. <clears throat> the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Through 
Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.